a very warm welcome to everyone who has joined us for the session on Edu-evaluation and the Future of Jobs at FICI's 93rd Annual Convention. This session will focus on critical areas of education, explore what would the jobs of the future look like, review various facets of the new education policy, and discuss the way forward, deliberate on the importance of skills and education that will prime India's youth for the future. Here to talk about this Edu-evolution are two extraordinary children, Shreyan Jha, a young and accomplished mathematician, and Akshita Imani, a budding neuroscientist. Accompanying them are Mr. Ravi Kailas, Chairman of Pravaha and Maitra Energy, and Mr. Ramji Raghavan, Chairman and Founder of Agastya. May I now invite Mr. Ravi Kailas to please speak about the initiative. Over to you. Thank you very much and good morning everyone. FIKI is the most storied business chamber in India, convened to protect the rights of Indian business since before independence. Today, six decades later, we are here to talk about the second freedom movement, the education movement. Agastya and Pravaha are at the forefront of this freedom movement and have joined hands to create the Navam Foundation. Over the next 10 years, Navam's ambitious vision is to build 10 world-class institutes of innovation across India to promote learning outcomes, holistic pedagogy, and access to education. These institutes of innovation serve as education research centers, creating blueprints for curriculum, teacher training, experiential learning, and more. And we will open source this and make it available to all education institutes in India. These institutes of innovation will also serve as campuses for giftedness programs to uplift the best and brightest youth across the country, irrespective of background, so that they may become examples for the nation and inspire their peers on the power of education. The need for real investment in education has never been greater. India has 250 million school age children, and they represent our greatest hope and future. A large number of children are unfortunately being left behind. Changing this will require new, innovative, and inspiring models of learning to be rapidly and effectively disseminated at scale across the country. We require massive mobilization, starting with the efforts of every single person on this call. If you feel inspired by this movement, you can be part of it. For the Navam Institutes, we are raising 3,000 crores of rupees over the next decade. This represents 300 crores per campus, 50 crores for infrastructure, and 250 crores for an operational corpus. Every movement starts with a small group of people making incremental progress with small contributions that add up to a tangible result. If just 100 people pledge 3 crores a year for 10 years, we will reach our goal of 3,000 crores. The goal to provide a basic right of education to children across India, including its best and brightest, to create the freedoms that will secure India's future. I will now hand you over to two brilliant and gifted young minds, Akshita and Shreyan, who will introduce each other. Akshita. Thank you, Mr. Ravi. Greetings, everyone. I am Akshita. Let me introduce my friend, Shreyan. Shreyan is a 12-year-old from Mumbai. He is homeschooled. Mathematics, science, philosophy, computer programming, and artificial intelligence have fascinated him since long. He has formed multiple theories about consciousness and mathematics. And a recent idea of his is a form of mathematics that exploits a loophole in Gödel's incompleteness theorem. With such intriguing ideas, Shreyan one day hopes to make his mark in the world. Thank you, Akshita. And let me tell you about her. Akshita is a 16 year old from Hyderabad. Always a funny thing, she's immersed herself in literature, the fine art, neuroscience, and the pursuits. Akshita sees a future where every child like her can reach their true potential. However, she has been one of the lucky few to be able to gain access to opportunities. Opportunities many others with her capabilities could not utilize. But was that even a problem? Are children unable to reach their full potential now? What problems are they facing? Let me tell you about a challenge I face and I'm still facing. I used to go to school up until two years ago. The syllabus always felt 
too easy. Even after a double promotion to sixth grade, while my peers were learning how to calculate distance within speed and time, I requested much more complex topics like quantum electrodynamics and advanced combinatorics. Turned out, time studying school has a high opportunity cost. So one fine day, I dropped out of school, opting for homeschooling where I could set my own pace of learning. I was lucky to connect with some great mentors who helped shape my path. But due to their busy schedule, classes would be held occasionally, and often I would not have a class at all. While Shreya's ideas may be unique, his problem affects an estimated 12.5 million gifted children. That's right, 12.5 million gifted children. Shreya and I have found our peace due to wondrous mentors at Niyas and Ram Foundation. But there exist many more who do not know about their full capabilities. A sea of intellect we have not tapped into yet. A gold mine we have not dug into yet. When I was 15, I had the good fortune to attend a doctor's camp. I was able to witness things ranging from tumors being removed from patients to patients recuperating in neurointensive care units. And at the end of a three-day camp, I thought to myself, I know what I want to do. In other words, I had my aha moment. But there are millions of children, 12.5 million, who do not have their aha moment. The human brain is a beautiful thing, for we do not know what its limit is. And with the right facilities, there's no limit to what these beautiful, gifted minds could accomplish. One day, you may have sat in that position where you had the capability but lacked direction. Today, the future of your company may be sitting with a child. Her gifts are recognized slowly fading into oblivion, but together we can find her and give her the tools she deserves to build a better tomorrow. With that, I would like to hand this over to Mr. Ramji Raghavan, Chairman of Agastya Foundation. Thank you. Thank you, Akshita. Thank you, Akshita. Ah, aha, ha, ha. Curiosity, creativity, and confidence. Qualities that Shreyan and Akshita have in spades. It's thrilling to hear their stories. Are they exceptional? Yes, indeed they are. At the same time, as they tell us, there are 12.5 million gifted children in India. Children, the majority of whom do not have the opportunity to realize the potential of their genes. The majority of whom do not get an opportunity to find a place in the sun. They are the lost Ramanujans, the lost Einsteins, and the lost Shakuntala Devis of this country. What a waste of human potential. This has to change. And to change this, we need to come together to find innovative ways and means to unlock the creative potential of millions of children. And this change is essential if India is going to become a creative, innovative, productive, and prosperous nation. As Ravi so eloquently put it, it's going to cost us 3,000 crores over the next 10 years. Is this a large amount? Hardly. It represents less than 0.5% of the philanthropy money that is expected to flow into various causes over the next 10 years in India. So let's come together and exploit the unique moment we are in. After all, the new national education policy is talking about a fundamental shift from what to think to how to think. This is a huge opportunity for all of us, therefore, to come together in this movement, imagine a new future, and make this wondrous dream happen. So please contact Fiki, contact Pravaha, contact Agastya, and let's work together to make this happen. Thank you very much, Fiki, and Namaskar. And Agastya, what an inspiring start to the session. May I now invite our moderator for the session, Mr. Manish Sabarwal, Chairman of the Board of Directors, Team Lee Services Limited, which is one of India's leading staffing and human capital firm, to take the session forward, please. Over to you, Mr. Sabarwal. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, after, especially after that inspiring opening. I think COVID is, uh, the planet is taking a gap year because of COVID and sort of Samaj, Bazaar and Sarkar 
society, um, business and government is reacting vigorously, but also very differently to this unmodelable world. But I think COVID has reminded us that um, per capita GDP matters more than total GDP. We may be fifth in the world in total GDP, but we are 138th in the world in per capita GDP. And for a long time, at least I've been making the case that India doesn't have a jobs problem, we have a wages problem. And today's panel is perfect for that, or today's session, because um, if you think about wages, where do they come from? They depend on the productivity of our regions, of our cities, of our firms, and of our individuals. And clearly there has been a policy window during COVID, uh, whether it was the MSME reform, whether it was labor reform, whether it was agricultural reform, and obviously the announcement of NEP. So today we have a great lineup for this session, which is at the intersection of jobs and education. It's always hard to predict where the future is going. You can't really predict the future or invent it. You can make yourself worthy of it. And today we have a wonderful lineup. We have a policy entrepreneur who shepherded the NEP. We have two education entrepreneurs who are building institutions. And we have a job entrepreneur who is sort of reinventing an industry. So unfortunately, Mr. Premji could not make it. Um, so we have a message from him, which they will quickly flash across the screen. And after that, I'll request um, Dr. Kasturi Rangan to give us his keynote. Um, Okay, um, I think we'll, have, we'll move on at the speed that Akshita um, would have read that faster than all of us, but uh, we're going to move to Dr. Rangan, who is uh, an inspiration to all of us um, who are thinking of making India better, both working from inside the system and outside the system. But, you know, change only comes when you sort of take that view that I will work with the existing ecosystem. Dr. Rangan is an inspiration who has changed so many parts of India for better, but most importantly, I think his lasting contribution will be to the, um, to the battle for ideas, if not the debate for ideas in education. What is education? What is the future of education? I think NEP is a wonderful document. You know, the 1948 Radhakrishnan report didn't mention vocational training. The 1968 Kotari Committee report thought education was MBAs and engineering. I think the 1986 education policy was different, but I think 2020 NEP synthesizes many of the hopes, aspirations, and dreams of corporate India, of, of Samaj Bazaar and Sarkar. Let's just say that. Thank you so much, Dr. Rangan, for being with us today. And please, we would love to hear from you on um, on NEP and everything else that you have learned um, working on education. Uh, thank you, Manish. It's a matter of great privilege for me to be asked to speak in this prestigious annual edu evolution and the future of jobs. I would like to express my thanks to Dr. Sikharati and the office bearers of FIKI for this honor. I'm happy to see the first message from Asim Premji. I may mention, I'm bringing back Asim Premji's name here because I may mention that Dr. Asim Premji, along with his dynamic CEO, Mr. Anurag Bear, kept the work related to NDP on several fronts, including organizing office space, participating in the drafting of the policy, designing and producing a high quality draft document, and also helping to review several thousands of public domain inputs for appropriate incorporation. I take this opportunity to thank Mr. Sinjanji for this very critical support that we received from him and Mr. Anurag. Well, I'm happy to see my friend Anish here, here at this session and also Dr. Ashi Gawal, Ramji Raghavan and other eminent panel members. The world is experiencing major transformative changes on several fronts, social, cultural, political, environmental, scientific, and so on, all impacting the socio-economic development and welfare of many nations. The central role of education in addressing these issues hardly needs any emphasis. 
the Indian educational lands cap in the recent times has evolved based on a policy crafted three decades ago. All of us recognize the urgent need to re revisit this policy and adopt a new one aligned to the 21st century imperatives. The new national education policy, NAP 2020, was born out of these considerations. India over the next decade will have the highest population of young people in the world, more than 50% below 35 years of age, aspiring for high quality education. This demographic dividend has to be taken advantage of globalization and demands of a knowledge economy and knowledge society call for emphasis on the need for acquisition of new skills by learners on a regular basis for them to learn how to learn and become lifelong learners, a critical consideration that needs to be addressed appropriately. Even as the new educational system will be aligned to the aspirational goals of the 21st century knowledge demands, it will also remain rooted to India's value systems and ethos. NEP 2020 provides an integrated yet flexible approach to education. It has kept the interconnectedness of the various phases of education in mind and how the same will enable continuity, coherence and processes to ultimately realize an end-to-end educational roadmap for the country. It also encompasses an articulation of a broad view of education encompassing the holistic development of youth with special emphasis on kindling their creative potential in all its richness and, and complexity. I would like to stress eight key policy provisions of the NAP 2020 in the above context, keeping in focus the theme of this session. First, the policy recommends transformative changes in the way the school education needs to be configured. Advances in developmental, cognitive, and educational psychology have considerably influenced our thinking about how we need to address the teaching and learning processes of the youngsters in their early childhood. They expand by 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 structure of the school education is based on a better understanding of the scientific basis for the child's learning trajectory from birth to secondary school. In this context, the first three stages of the school's education, that is foundational, preparatory, and middle, defined in conformity with the developmental phases of the child, namely transition from perceptual learning to conceptual learning, and then on to prescriptive learning and abstraction are taken cognizant. The distinction between curricular, extracurricular, and co curricular, as well as arts, sciences, and vocational subjects are done away with making the education holistic. The first flavor of vocations will be experienced in middle school itself. The final secondary four years stay, students are enabled to the exploration of their interests and strengths. It is here that the policy calls for deeper exposure to vocational education so that they are fully prepared to decide at the end of 15 years of schooling whether they will pursue vocational professions or higher education. The policy of the government must be what is one vocational subject in this period. This brings in an early linkage between the schooling system and the surrounding ecosystem that may encompass like hospitals, industry, agricultural practices, ecological activities, and challenges to social needs such as water and waste management. Here, the students should avail of the hands on training for. The theoretical basis could be provided either at school or at a formal technical training institute. The second point, important policy item on this is the implications for jobs is related to the major policy shift in the higher education system with emphasis on holistic and multidisciplinary education with a four year undergraduate degree program. Our present undergraduate system looks to achieve mastery in five years, and a short sighted policy would simply help call for job readiness on day one. This policy recognizes that such an approach is dangerously out of step with the world that is rapidly changing. It recognizes that students must be given a much broader multidisciplinary foundation 
so that they can adopt and reinvent themselves as necessary over their entire working lives. The four-year undergraduate program will provide students with the opportunity to explore their interests and develop abilities. I also want to stress the holistic aspect which aims to develop all the capacities, not just intellectual, but aesthetic, social, physical, emotional, and moral capacities and in the greatest manner to create a well-rounded individual. Such an approach is necessary to provide the kind of education that is required for the 21st century. The third point, this policy carries the firm view that the vocational education must be integrated with undergraduate education. Not only is this consistent with the principles of holistic development, but it gives students an avenue to the world of work that is increasingly important in the 21st century. I want to clearly emphasize this point because we tend to have a very narrow conception of vocational education. And we therefore undervalue it. With advances in technology such as AI and augmented reality, we clearly foresee an increasing number of hybrid jobs where humans' vocational skills will complement the capacities of high tech equipment. The higher education system is therefore necessary to prepare students for such jobs. Fourth point the four year system will also give all students option to pursue undergraduate research and an honors degree will grant them direct access to PhD programs. When it comes to research, India has low output of high quality research, not only places at a serious short term disadvantage on strategic and economic fronts, but there is also a severe long term risk because the quality of research is essential for quality education. The present fragmented system of small colleges cannot sustain quality teaching and research programs. Thus, the policy calls for an urgent consolidation of higher education institutions that focus on research and teaching, complemented by a system of degree gathering autonomous colleges that focus on providing high quality education. The fifth point is that the policy also highlights the critical need for better managed research at all levels pure research, applied research, translation of research, and research to address specific needs to be provided and then for social and industrial objectives. The oversight of research will be provided by the National Research Foundation, whose primary role will be to nurture a vibrant research ecosystem through adequate funding, mentoring, and careful monitoring. The NRF will ensure that research proposals are selected purely based on merit by following a rigorous peer review process. In addition to funding projects of critical importance, such as mitigating the impact of climate change and so on, NRF will support multidisciplinary research in the arts and humanities, social sciences, natural sciences and mathematics, engineering and technology, including educational technology. The sixth, educational technology applications and research must play a crucial role not only in achieving a higher gross enrollment ratio by improving access to quality higher education, but in improving the resilience of the entire educational system from disruptions such as the one we are facing today. In this regard, NRF will work closely with the National Educational Technology Forum, NEDF, a new autonomous entity recommended in the policy, which should provide a platform for crucial dialogue between educators and education technology entrepreneurs. This facilitates well considered strategies for the introduction of technologies into the education system. NETF will be a highly deliberative body that will distinguish between genuine disruption and the mere hype. Without such a platform, educators can often end up repurposing technology develop other applications and, the, and further this could be obviously not ideal. Further, I'm convinced that EdTech is a fertile domain for entrepreneurs and the forum will help these entrepreneurs better understand the kind of challenges education is facing so that they can develop effective technological solution. The seventh point I would like to make is that the policy has brought forth a noble scheme to provide flexibility in making academic choices of courses and institutions and choosing 
the appropriate time for one's career, learn more bonds with the appropriate credit at all stages. The academic bank of credit is proposed by NDP 2020 promises to be a game changer. It works on the principle of multiple entry, multiple exit, as well as any time learning, anywhere learning, and any level learning as envisaged by the NDP. It to facilitate the integration of the campuses and distributed learning systems by creating student mobility within inter and intra university system. The process does not block sharing of credits between public and private institutions. The entire process lends itself to lifelong learning opportunities, thereby enabling everyone to be relevant to the needs of our most importantly to the needs of jobs. I want to try to give you some highlights of NEP 2020 in order to give you an idea of the amount of seriousness with the question of jobs have been addressed in formulating the policy. As a main point, I would like to add that there are many other dimensions of education with its own influential role in creating new and innovative opportunities, such as the policy on online wages. For instance, the policy has proposed several measures for creating opportunities for strengthening education and research related to Indian languages, including regional languages, modern languages, and classical languages, so also in foreign languages. Equally important are the aspects of related to the preservation and promotion of India's tangible and intangible cultural heritage, enhancing the participation of the international community in our educational programs is another dimension. In drawing up the framework of NDP 2020, we have taken full cognizance of India's long and illustrious history of holistic education. I'm extremely happy that organizations like FIKI that have contributed in an influential way to the crafting of the policy are now taking it forward as a part of the implementation phase. The accelerated effort that we are witnessing in the present quarter, in the in different quarters, starting with the central government agencies, state government agencies, individual educational institutions, including school and higher education institutions, as well as other stakeholders, testified to the tremendous enthusiasm when the policy is being taken forward at this particular juncture. The present political system under the vision of the leadership of the Prime Minister has unambiguously declared that no efforts will be spared to implement this policy with all its multiple dimensions. It is now up to all of us, both at the individual and collective levels, to ensure that India makes rapid and smooth progress as it re-establishes itself as a knowledge powerhouse. I wish FIKI the very best for their own vital contribution towards this noble cause. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So as the policy entrepreneurship of NEP will um, inspire all of us and hopefully clear paths for many of us who have been thinking about this. I'll now switch from the policy entrepreneurship of NEP to, to just thinking about the future and maybe I'll ask my panelist Ritesh, are you there? Do you want to switch on your video? Yes, sir. Absolutely. So I'll ask, so I'll ask Ritesh to start first in the same order about what are your thoughts about the uh, future of jobs, education, and most importantly, the intersection of jobs and education as you think about your industry or the world broadly? Thank, thank you so much, Mr. Sabarwal. And of course, it's uh, very tough coming after, uh, you know, Mr. Kasturi Ranjan given his uh, very wise thoughts, but I will try and attempt in, in any manner possible. Uh, typically, for me, I'm uh, uh, first off very, very thankful and glad that I got the opportunity to come and speak. Uh, this university uh, may not be the best fit to talk about uh, the future of education, uh, but just for uh, that's on a lighter note. But for the interest of this group, uh, I stopped out of university uh, because of a program called the Thiel Fellowship. Uh, the Thiel Foundation is run by somebody called Peter Thiel, who's the founder of PayPal, early investor in Facebook. He gives $100,000 to 20 people under the age of 20. 
acceptance rates are lower than Ivy Leagues, but the condition is you have to stop out of university. So uh, listening to Mr. Ramji and these incredible kids uh, reminded me that I used to think the same way, saying that uh, I don't relate with the other kids in, uh, in my own class and uh, I, I just aspire to do newer things. Uh, I see um, uh, Ranjan Mittal Saab here, so I had the good opportunity to sell SIM cards for Airtel back in the day and I used to enjoy doing that much more than uh, usual education and I think uh, the TF Fellowship truly allowed me to pursue uh, that opportunity and I hope that a lot of other young kids will, will do very well. Other TF Fellows have gone on to build cryptocurrencies like Ethereum, one other TF Fellow built a company that recently went public. But that besides, I, I'm, I, I really enjoyed what I heard uh, to begin with from these incredibly gifted kids like Akshita uh, and, and other young kids. Uh, I, I hope that uh, what you're doing, uh, you know, uh, will, will create uh, the next Nikhil Kamats and a lot of other young uh, successful entrepreneurs as well beyond uh, the Ramanujans as well as, uh, you know, uh, the Shakuntla Devis of our country. But that reminds me of today's discussion and I will keep it as tight as possible for the uh, time. I think one of the things as OEO over the years I have seen, the few things that I've learned and I'll try to share just some of those for the future of jobs. We have created jobs for over 10,000 people directly and hundreds of thousands of people indirectly across the world. And there are a few learnings I have had in the process. The first learning is that no matter what industry you are in, technology, data sciences uh, will fundamentally enter and uh, re-evaluate uh, how your industry has existed or will exist in the future. For instance, we serve small hotels and holiday homes across the world and our primary job is to ensure they can get better returns. Earlier in the hotel industry, there used to be hundreds of people. Uh, if you have a 20, 30,000 hotel uh, uh, platform, you'd have hundreds of people who'd be managing pricing every day and they used to be called revenue managers. In the new generation we live in, uh, machines do that job. You can work with the machines to ensure that you train them very well in logic, but after that dynamic pricing can be run by machines themselves by means of which small hotels are able to generate two to three times jump in online revenue and the cost of operating substantially reduces. Similarly, in almost every other ecosystem, you would see this change that would come very quickly. And my hope is that as young people consider looking at their skill sets and as education uh, institutions look at uh, re-evaluating the programs, data sciences uh, and engineering will be given due importance. The second, which is uh, very critical, is project management abilities, ability to openly communicate, sports, especially for children both in K-12 as well as in universities, being able to look at sports as a competitive uh, field wherein people learn a lot of important life skills are few areas that I have learned uh, as being very critical. The second segment that I have seen creating substantial value is a segment of what I call as the best first job. Lot of hospitality employees consider their first job to be OYO. They come to OYO, they get trained, they wear, learn wearing clothes well, they learn getting uh, uh, to speak uh, well, grooming themselves and so on. And then in a few months or a year, get another job and we are okay with it. And we believe that this is a similar service that companies like that of Domino's, etc., enable for a completely different segment. My hope is for that segment, again, vocational skills would be enabled to ensure that they can become successful. Lots of companies can bring digital backed internships to ensure that trainings which enable employees to be ready for jobs like that of OYO are not imparted very easily by academic institutions. We are working very closely with a lot of them to ensure that we can pre-train talent well before they come to the OYO hotels. Last but not the least, I believe two macro feedbacks. The first is I think increasingly a perspective of creativity needs to be created um, in, in Indian industry for which I would like to consider Indian industry to consider stock options as a, a way of being able to appreciate employees and bring a sense of ownership in them. Something that I have seen very closely with uh, working with people. 
And the last one is something that I haven't done very well, but I'm really working hard to try and improve on that, is bringing academia uh, and the industry connects much closer. How can we ensure that the toughest of problems facing us, we can go to academy and young, exciting uh, uh, programs in, in universities and, and bring, bring it over there. So this is a broad range of few learnings I have had over the years that I wanted to share as uh, you know, a lot of our friends in the industry are considering thinking about the next generation of uh, education and, uh, you know, potential policies, both in industry as well as academia, uh, as we think about the future. Thank you so much. Thanks, Richard. Uh, thanks, Ritesh. I just wanted to, you know, just one quick question, maybe because you, you sort of started off with the Peel Fellowship, and obviously that's a very interesting view of the world. But um, how would you sort of react to people who say that, you know, uh, there is a lot of learning by doing, there is a lot of learning um, by thinking and by reflecting. I mean, there are many forms of learning, but why does it have to be at the expense of formal, structured, institutional learning? Why do we have to make choices here? Why not, why not um, like through history, people have learned structure, then by learning, then by books, then by the networks, then by, so why, why pick one over the other? So, you know, uh, when we signed the Thier Fellowship contract, Manish, the first line are uh, Mark Twain's fa famous word, which is, uh, uh, we never let university interfere with education. I think education is what we should all be pursuing, regardless of what format or structure it comes in. Uh, each one there is right. Who, whatever format anybody can get educated and can keep pursuing that education all through their lives. That's what, in my view, is most important. Rather than saying that, hey, there is a structure we've come up with. Uh, let's uh, let's not question this, regardless of whether uh, this is the best way for an individual to pursue education or not. So, in, in my view. Uh, education should be more important than the way that it is imparted. If somebody can get educated in some other way, uh, uh, wish them best. Th that's just my personal opinion. Yeah, that's a great point. And please, we'll have a discussion with the panelists. So next, Ashish, you're a policy entrepreneur and an education entrepreneur. So what are your thinkings about the intersection and the future of education and jobs? Yeah, thanks, Manish. Uh, so firstly, I want to congratulate Dr. Kasturi Rangan and the government on the new education policy. I think it's a it's a landmark guiding policy document. Uh, and I want to point out a few things that are related to the future of jobs. You know, we are talking a lot about higher education and vocational education, but we must not forget that foundational numeracy and literacy is first and foremost the bedrock of any economy and any development in society. Um, you know, whether it's uh, China or uh, going back to the West earlier, they first ensured that all their citizens had basic literacy and numeracy. They knew how to read, write, do basic math. And in India, we're still far behind. About half our children uh, are not able to achieve these basic literacy and numeracy goals. And now the government has launched a new mission after the NMP came out to focus on FLN, foundational literacy and numeracy. So I think that's number one, because without that bedrock, you know, skilling at the end of the day I think you've said it, and I always say it is the repair business. We need our students to be ready and have that solid foundation. So that I think is critical. Secondly, you know, the new education policy does talk about vocational. Vocational is kind of broken, and even in schools, in high school, to do vocational is going to be very difficult. But what we have is an interesting bifurcation in our education system. About half the children now go to private school, and half go to government school. It's essentially the bottom half of the socioeconomic pyramid, not exactly, that goes to government schools. So can we look at repurposing the half that go to government schools in secondary school to be more vocational schools? It will require real concerted effort over the next five, 10 years. We'll have to move away from the anodyne, boring curricula that we have for vocational. It's, it's absolutely terrible. We'll have to rip it apart. We'll have to use technology. We'll have to look at general employability skills and embedding that into the curriculum. Because not everybody will go into very specialized field. India is still going to be more of a services economy. But I think there's the opportunity in high school to completely rip it up and to completely repurpose government schools. Private schools can continue doing what they're doing. A third is, I would say, with regards to higher education. And there, my experience really stems from Ashoka University, where our belief has always been 
that multidisciplinary education, you know, the liberal arts, which is really multidisciplinary holistic, which is called out as, again, the most significant reform in higher education, the new education policy, is critical because knowledge is changing very rapidly. And what we want is our students to really develop a love for learning so that they are lifelong learners. And uh, they do, they're lifelong learners across domains. They can connect the dots. And they have good communication skills. Ritesh was saying there's no point having great ideas if you can't write well or express yourself verbally. I think that's really important. A lot of people are very bullish on tech and data, and I understand the world is moving in that direction. But I think what we need to look at is, you know, people should study whatever they want to study. I don't think you should just go into engineering or just go into data science. I mean, frankly, study what you love studying. Computation is going to become more of a horizontal. You don't need to study computer science. You just don't need to, you shouldn't be a technophobe. You should understand the basics. Um, the same way mathematics went from becoming a vertical to a horizontal. You can't be an economist unless you have the basics of mathematics. Similarly, I think computation and data science is becoming a horizontal. It's a basic foundational skill that a lot of students need to have. The other is this sort of industry academic academia connect. I know Fiki represents industry. I think the challenge is on both sides. Industry just doesn't do enough to connect with academia. And our institutions also dis don't respond well. But I would encourage, as opposed to industry, looking at such transactional relationships, saying we're going to work with a few institutions, really put our people to work with the academics, and be much more deliberate about a five, ten year agenda in one or two focus areas, as opposed to this small, bite sized, very transactional relationship. Uh, Ashoka, for instance, has just signed a, an MOU with the IPA, the Indian Pharmaceutical Association. We're going to work with them on curriculum development for our master's programs industry-led PhD programs and work with the association over the next five, 10 years. And we need many more of these kinds of partnerships if we're going to be successful. The last is with regards to digital, where I think um, EdTech can play a big role in massifying uh, higher education, knowledge, this lifelong, what I call a 60-year curriculum. I mean, in the journey of a 60-year curriculum where high school and uh, college are important milestones, we're going to be lifelong learners. And so how can we, you know, get different doses of education at different points in our life, uh, which are relevant to us both from the workplace, but also in terms of living a more meaningful life. And I think there we've just started something called Ashoka X, but I think every institution, every one of the top 200 institutions really needs to start something there. Companies should actually look at starting their own courses as well as you've seen on Coursera now lots of leading companies Google Microsoft IBM have their own courses and I think that's a big opportunity in terms of lifelong learning uh, as well I would say that in terms of the future of jobs we also need to think about women you know women female participation in the workforce is really low now it's interesting women do as well as men frankly better in school we have as many girls as boys. The gross enrollment ratio in college is the same. So it's not that the supply side doesn't exist, but there are certain societal barriers. So we need some behavior change, hard societal barriers to cross. But I think there are lots of problems on the demand side as well. And we need to look at on the demand side, how do we define norms for companies? How do we make our cities safer, transport? I mean, really make the workplace more women friendly because it's abysmal that we're at 25% female participation in the workforce when women hold up half the sky, as Mao said. So I think more research and more work and industry really needs to take on responsibility. You can't say we'd like it to happen and then not set targets for yourself. And I, I think Fiki needs to look at this as much as any other association. And uh, we have about five, six academics at Ashoka who do work in this area. We'd love to partner with Fiki and others on this. And the final one I would say is with education particularly, we have to look at the private sector. You know, 47% of our children go to private schools, about 70% of students go to private higher education institutions. How do we create the right incentives for them to really focus on not only improving learning outcomes, but getting our students to be ready for future jobs, for the workplace and for the evolving workplace? I think that's really important uh, because you can't just browbeat them 
the way you can browbeat the public system. And finally, I'll just touch on research, which Dr. Kosturi Rangan also talked about. As a country, we need to invest in science and technology. Universities are at the core of that. And uh, the National Research Foundation is a good start. But I would say industry also needs to come and look at this more seriously and what they can do alongside the National Research Foundation, alongside institutions, and really leveraging our institutions to build the future India. So thanks, Manish. So just two quick questions for you, um, Ashish. One would be around, do you think that we have sort of ownership neutral guidelines in education? I mean, in banking, we don't, you know, public sector, private sector have an apartheid. But do you think we're starting to get to the point where because of the role of the large role of the private sector now, we're reaching sort of parity in terms of regulatory ecosystem or not? And second is technology. You know, the world has been forced into this mandatory global digital literacy program in the last nine months. What is your thought now? Is it 20% less? Is it then a physical classroom? Is it different because uh, you're getting the academics, but you're not getting social? I mean, in the last nine months, or, uh, or technology works in iterations, and this is forcing us to learn, and in a few months or few years, we'll get to parity there too. Yeah. So I think this whole private-public parity, I think the new education policy does touch on this, and, and I think it finally addresses this issue that we do need uh, to treat them as equals. Uh, I wouldn't say we need, let's not go for heavy dose regulation of the private sector. We just need greater transparency coupled with greater autonomy. Uh, we take away the license raj from the private sector um, and someday even look at, you know, should there be some sense of a for-profit structure there? Because the truth is all of them, I mean, we are not at Ashoka, but most institutions are for-profit and uh, if you want to take the informal into the formal, then you have to tell the cat at some point, right? Uh, I think finally, with regards to uh, technology, I think technology play a different role at different types of higher education institutions. At, at top tier institutions like the IITs or SOCAs, frankly, I think the undergraduate level is going to be physical. I mean, if anything, this COVID period has shown that digital, fails in comparison to the physical. It's not a complete education. Uh, and obviously we need to weave in technology into the teaching learning process. But so much of who you are is a function of getting away from home and learning from your peers and you know that environment that's been created. But I think at the, the if you look at the Carnegie classification of higher education, you know, the top tier being these research universities, I think at the bottom end, at whether it's undergraduate education, vocational, whether it's a one year, two year, three year, as is laid out in the NEP, I think there EdTech can play a much more meaningful role. And we need more blended programs. I wouldn't say EdTech only, but blended. I think if anything, the MOOCs have shown, just leaving content out there is like selling books in a bookstore. I mean, those who are most motivated will buy them and actually read them, right? So we, we need more sort of blended with online learning assistance and blended forms of education uh, at that level. So I think education holds a lot of promise. At the graduate level, by the way, I think education is going to play an even more important role. Master's degrees are going to get disintermediated or bust up into micro masters. And then this whole idea of lifelong learning, which is really a bunch of micro masters through your journey beyond undergraduate or beyond high school, you know, going forward, which will be tech uh, delivered. Thanks. Thanks, Ashish. Um, Mayank, you want to? Uh... Hi. No, thanks. Uh, thanks, Sarval. No, I think the uh, hearing all these topics, this is something that uh, we at Upgrad live and breathe uh, on an ongoing basis, how technology can enable us to scale education to a very large section of society. Uh, but maybe uh, Manish, what I'll do is I'll run through just some observations that we have had and therefore what has been our learning and what we feel uh, is missing in the ecosystem, specifically when it comes to changing of landscape of jobs, career, and therefore what role can education play. Uh, I think what we have noticed at least um, two, three generations back when job used to get handed down from generation after generation, your surname used to define what job would you be doing. Uh, and I think in the last generation, we moved to one job in one career span. And today when we are talking to individuals and I, we hire, I mean, hundreds of individuals every week to two weeks who come and join us at Upgrad. And I ask them one question, how many jobs have you had and how many experience 
how many years of experience are you currently at? Uh, and always the answer is three to five years in a single job and I'm shifting and I'm flipping job um, as if I'm flipping a calendar on an every new year basis. That shift and that rapid change in jobs, uh, specifically in the current generation, means as what everyone has said, lifelong learning will become a norm and not an exception. And when I talk to, a, to my uh, six-year-old son about what he should be doing in, in his future, I don't think 50% of the jobs that he would have access to even exist today. Uh, and therefore, uh, what uh, Dr. Kasturi Rangan said that, look, learning how to learn is an extremely, extremely important skill uh, that all of us will have to develop. Uh, um, and the shift that we are seeing from a job for my entire generation to job switching and flipping on a consistent basis will mean that people will have to go back to universities and colleges or education needs uh, to stay relevant in the ecosystem. Um, and for us, therefore, uh, uh, when we're looking at this ecosystem of lifelong learning, I mean, we are coining it as Bachpan Se Pachpan Tak, uh, or PK, what a lot of people call about. Uh, uh, you will have to continue to go back uh, to uh, to education to stay relevant to the fast changing environment that we are seeing right now. Um, and it's not just uh, because of what's happening in the in the job market, but fundamentally technology has disrupted not just jobs, but the way things get done. Uh, and I think our IT sector, which literally built our middle class in some form or fashion, uh, uh, there's a talk of job loss. Uh, my personal take is that uh, uh, with that technology shift happening, I don't think a lot of jobs will get lost. A lot many more new jobs will get created. Uh, and where we took a strong position of IT, uh, uh, I mean, India being the IT capital and, and technology capital uh, globally, can India become the digital capital globally, uh, where a lot of cutting edge work, whether it's on AI, machine learning, data science, et cetera, can potentially happen uh, from the ecosystem uh, uh, coming out of India. And that shift, I think you're hearing from all the IT services conversation that moving us from 50,000 US dollar per employee to 100,000 US dollar employee, um, what does that mean and how we can reskill the entire employee pool uh, to get relevant to that ecosystem. That's where, uh, uh, Manisha, to me, uh, one of the two interesting observations that I had uh, was this phenomenal change that we are doing with national education policy, uh, uh, where uh, we are enabling the education system to stay relevant to what the needs of the industry and the needs of the job ecosystem is, uh, where you are coming out with exit options during the course of your program. Because I think in India, you cannot have four-year undergrad, uh, three-year undergrad. People may want to exit, get a part sort of a credential, and then move up and come back to the education system later. The concept of credit bank, which will make lifelong learning far more relevant uh, to what we speak right now, uh, the new online degree policy, um, um, which will open up a very different ecosystem. I mean, today for every, I don't know, I'm mean, just sort of seeing 20, 25 people who are on the panel today on the, on, the, on the screen right now. There are about 75 people of similar age group who haven't had access to higher education in this country. Uh, and if India has to move up on the GR, the online degree policy to sort of taking it to that level um, is an extremely, extremely crucial part. But I do believe that uh, to a lot of these policy changes that we are talking about, it has to get implemented much faster. Uh, unfortunately, the, the demographic dividend, we do not have enough time uh, uh, to make that shift, to make online education the mainstream, um, uh, to bring sort of high quality technology to making good education accessible. And that's why to the last one that I would mention that, look, while online has to play a very important role, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. I, I mean, um, uh, Ashish mentioned a very important point that uh, making content accessible is making glorified libraries. Uh, and we are not, we don't require libraries in this country as much as we require high quality education access. And there's a significant amount of um, investment that needs to be done in making education rigorous when it comes to online and making outcomes very meaningful. And that's where one of the big things that we don't realize while schools are turned online, the biggest advantage of having schools where that it taught children how to sit in one place for eight hours before they can hit the factory or the work life. But I think those activities are still a lot of work to be done. And to just summarize and round it up, uh, Manish, for me, while lifelong learning will become a norm uh, and online will play an important role, there's a significant amount of investment work that still needs uh, to ensure that we can win this ecosystem. But if we do so, uh, uh, India can not only solve for India educational job problem, but potentially has the opportunity of becoming the teaching capital of the world, given the manpower that we have in the, uh, to, to our sort of access. No, thanks. Thanks, Mike. Thanks.
Thanks, Mayank. Um, I, you know, you said your six-year-old son may live in a world where 50% of the jobs don't exist today. Actually, we have to be careful with this kind of presentism. You know, historians warn against a disease called presentism. 50% of the jobs created in the U.S. in every decade since 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s did not exist in the decade before that. So we're not living in these special, unique times that somehow make us breathless. But let me ask you one uh, quick question. Um, there is a criticism that online learning works for upgrade. It doesn't work for in the repair in the prepare, repair, and upgrade continuum. Online learning works for upgrade because there is a motivated learner. It does not work for prepare, particularly for first generation learners, and it's hard to make for repair. I, I'm not. I don't. I'm not saying I agree with that. But what would be your reaction be to that sort of? Um, at this point in time, technology hasn't got to the point where it works for repair, prepare, and upgrade. Do you say, agree or not really? No, I think, uh, I mean, technology to me, uh, Manish has to find a place where it first gets accepted. And I agree to your point that repair is the first place where acceptance is pretty high uh, and it just picks up much faster. But the way things are changing and things are evolving, where you can have a mentor of hundreds of coaches uh, and one on one counseling and one on one coaching on a Zoom or a or a Google Hangout, etc., where that personal connect can be formed. Um, sometimes you fail to understand that online education is about making a blinker that connects your eyes to your laptop uh, so that you don't blink away. Uh, while in a classroom, you can. That aspect of technology development, there's still some time to go. So as we speak with the current technology, I think repair is a very solid sort of proposition that online provides. But the way things are changing with personalization data and hand-holding support coming in, I think prepare and ensuring that people on the early part of undergrad, I don't think K through 12 to a very large extent um, uh, will get that impact, but undergrad will start having uh, online education coming in as well. Okay, thanks a lot. I'm sorry we are really out of time, so I'm going to hand over to Suhail. We um, are really running behind, so thank you very much. Sorry we can't have a panel together, but uh, Suhail, it's your all yours to wrap up. Thanks. Uh, First, I'd like to compliment and congratulate Fiki for attempting and for doing what they've done qua education. I have a fundamental issue here, and I think Dr. Kasturi Rangan highlighted it and so did Ashish. For decades, because of societal pressures, we as a country and we as a society have harped more on education rather than on knowledge. To my mind, knowledge is the overarching a pyramid under which all these other elements sit, including giftedness, whatever. Knowledge, according to Jiddu Krishnamurti, who I've had a lot of regard for, one of our finest thinkers of modern India, he said knowledge is actually an expression of freedom from fossilized thinking. Knowledge feeds on data. Knowledge feeds on, on information. Knowledge feeds on experiences. Education, sadly, in our country, has been a journey from class 0 to 11 at one stage, 0 to 12, college, you know, someone mentioned masters, and then out in the job market. What we've therefore created is a society of cookie cutters, cookie cutters in every which way, which is why we are the software power of the world, and yet Facebook, Google, none of this was invented in India. It was invented overseas. And that begs a question. Is there something radically wrong with the way we look at education oblique knowledge? I think the answer is yes. Is there a problem that can be solved? You know, Ashish and I have had very brief conversations and only one long conversation. And I believe over the last 30, 40, 50 years, we, dis we allowed liberal arts to die in India. Will, will, involve and will create a greater, a more robust India. And that's what we are striving for. You know, it's very interesting, Manish and all the other panelists, the theme of Fiki's AGM this year is inspired India. Inspiration is not bottled up. Inspiration can't be controlled. Inspiration can't be sold through a vending machine. Inspiration needs unfettered minds. It needs fields of knowledge to bloom. It needs oaks to grow into massive trees it, and, and, you know, create that, that dimension under which people can learn. So I have the four following things to say, and then I'll keep quiet. Number one, 
we need to make a distinction between education and knowledge in this country. Number two, we need to create, to my mind, and you know, there are people like eminent people like Pankaj Patel, Sanjeev Mehta, people who are running large businesses. They will know this better than I do. Number two, we need to stop creating societal shame for people who we believe are not degree driven. If they were degree driven, there'd be no Ritesh Agarwal, there'd be no Bill Gates, there'd be, I mean, I know Harshpati is educated, but you know what I mean. Number three, we need corporate support. Now, whether it's a private public, whether it's a tax benefit, I don't know what it is. Fiki should actually strive. Fiki should approach the government to say that, look, you need to give tax write-offs. If a Pankaj Patel, if a, if a Unilever, if a Harshpati Singhania is willing to invest in education oblique knowledge, he or she must be encouraged. You need to encourage people. You don't need to look down upon people and say, oh, create a trust. Don't do this. Don't do that. We have too many goddamn don'ts in this country. I said, we are sitting, Manish, on a gold mine of talent. We are sitting on a pool of magnificent minds. You know, we are not a country. We are a civilization. We have a civilizational history to ourselves. We need to rediscover that, which is why it is not only India's second freedom movement, but it is now or never. With due apologies to Elvis Presley. And I've actually kept to four minutes, 20 seconds in the Perfect. spirit of Fiki's amazing precision. Perfect. Thank you, Sohail. Um, it's a pleasure. Thank you to all the panelists. Uh, I think the 21st century has a, a point, new appointment for India with its twist of with destiny. I think we missed that because we didn't do as much on education and jobs as we could have, but now we're fixing that problem. So thank you all for um, taking the time to hear us and to be here today, and I'll hand it back to Fiki now.